This is Red Essay, Dispositions of an Urban Cherokee. My name is Brandon Caruso. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Season 2 of Red Essay brings Native leaders from all over the country to share their insights, their work, and how to transcend just being a citizen of your tribe. It's a place where you too can find out the secrets to success in the worlds of community leadership, politics, academia, and much more. Honestly, it's got a lot of gems I think you're going to enjoy. So without further ado, enjoy Red Essay Season 2. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Red Essay Season 2, and this season we're focusing on Native leadership, and I'm proud to bring on Tribal Counselor Kara Cowan-Watts this week. She's not only a Tribal Counselor for the Cherokee Nation, but she's a huge advocate for college-bound students, whether being in the high school or the middle school. She uh, has a workshop that she goes around for free and uh, does her best to make sure that these people are ready in tackling what's called the digital divide. Now, I hadn't heard of that before, but... Uh, you, we're going to find out a little bit about what that is and how it pertains to you or the uh, Indian Territory. Uh, we're also going to be discussing what it's like to grow up as an at-large person and trying to pay for college through scholarships and why if you or your family haven't looked into the sciences or math, why it would behoove you to take a second look. So without further ado, here's Counselor Kara Cowan Watts. Enjoy the show. My name is Kara Cowan Watts, and I've served on the Cherokee Nation Tribal Council since 2003. I'm in my last four year term, or my third four year term, and I will end my term on Tribal Council in 2015. In my background, I have a Bachelor's of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering, a Master's of Science in Telecommunications Management, and I'm all but dissertation on my PhD in Biosystems Engineering on our Tribal Water Quality Standards. Wow. Uh, if you don't mind if I ask, what's going on with our uh, tribal wa water quality standards right now? Um, we do have tribal water quality standards. They could be a lot more sophisticated, um, but in, until we have different leadership, I'm afraid we probably won't have the water quality standards I think we should have in order to protect our running and still waters in the Cherokee Nation. Sure. So tell me a little bit about your scholarship workshop, which... Uh, it's just this amazing opportunity. I, I, I'll let you tell you because you're going to have a much better description. Well, I grew up at large as a Cherokee Nation citizen, meaning I did not live in the 14 counties of the Cherokee Nation. So although I lived in Oklahoma, I had no access to Cherokee Nation programs and services, same as pretty much we have today. I mean, that's the reality of living in another nation. So I lived in Seminole Nation physically. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, so I grew up at large. Uh, my parents are both retired teachers, and they would have been teaching at that time. So they made too much money for me to be Pell eligible, but not enough money to assist me in the college process. Ah, okay, I'm very familiar with that. Yes. <laughs> so growing up at large, uh, I never received a dime of money from the Cherokee Nation for my education, but I was able to pay for everything, including room and board, with scholarships that I applied for successfully. Um, and it, it, I just was, I had a full ride for my bachelor's degree, my master's, and now my PhD. I'm just now paying for it because I've extended it so long due to my sure. commitment with the Cherokee Nation. Right, so. Right. And are, are these scholarships primarily coming from the Cherokee Nation, or are they on a larger stage? No, my, my three-hour workshop um, and, and the handouts that accompany it are, were developed by me over the past 15-plus years. So I graduated high school in 92, graduated with my bachelor's in 97. And it was really during my work as a student with Oklahoma State University American Indian Science and Engineering Society, or ACES chapter, our college chapter, I became the scholarship workshop or scholarship chairperson for a committee. Oh, I see. And it was during time as a college student where I started figuring out, and it was very physical at that point, meaning it was hand typed on a typewriter. There wasn't, internet was just really becoming. No um, way. Yeah, in 94, 95, <laughs> internet was just developing still okay. in a broader sense. Uh, so, um, scribing them into stone. That's right. Like you couldn't see, <laughs> so you had to physically mail off, you had to request a application. They would physically mail it to you. Okay. You would physically fill it out typically and return it. So now almost everything's online. Sure. Which is great for the students, I think. But we have people in Indian country that still struggle with that because of the digital divide. Oh, yes. Interesting. So, That's something, actually, I really don't know anything about, but it makes a lot of sense. I mean, how bad is that? How bad is it really? So you have some areas where there's just poor to no coverage. Okay. Even in Oklahoma. 
I think it's especially true still for our reservation communities. There has been a lot of effort to bridge the digital divide, meaning just access to the internet. Yeah. What um, several, I think many of our tribal citizens in Oklahoma, and this would be true across Indian country and for any of our poor communities, they can they afford the access? Mm, right. And we're not talking about a phone. We're talking about full-on computer usage where you can properly see an application and be online. I mean, yeah. computer's still expensive, and so is that Internet coverage. Yeah. So not everybody has that, and you can't really do a college application on your smartphone. Right. Interesting. And so these, uh, I mean, are there any accommodations, I mean, available? I mean, what? Uh... So most like in rural Oklahoma, and I would assume it's true here in California or wherever you're at, your library normally has connections and your librarian should be able to help you. That's the feedback I get from home. Okay. I try to work with the local librarians and support the local library because they're going to have anywhere, depending on the size of the library, two to ten or more terminals. And they can make time. So a lot of the students I've mentored, they will, if they do not have access at home, you can find them at the library if it's after school hours or in the summer if you're doing applications or on a break. Yeah, okay. That's, uh, and that makes a lot of sense, sure. And, and I, uh, that's a great resource. Um, yeah, where, never forget your public libraries. Right. Actually, i got a <laughs> book due right now. i got to bring that. Um, where is your workshop now, and how long did it take to get there? So I've probably focused a lot of energy on public, these public presentations that I've done as yes. a volunteer for like 15 years, I think, at wow. this point. So um, November 1st is my next big annual one in my area that I do public uh, because if it's, if it's a school, the school has to invite me in. You know, I can't just invite myself in. Yeah. Or if it's a community, I've done it for other tribal communities, they have to invite me in. And, sure. you know, the, the workshop being three hours now means it's almost 20 pages per booklet. Wow. So I no longer have the resources to make copies on my own. So whoever hosts me also has to make copies because oh, it's become pretty, um, I mean, there's just a cost sure. that I have to do. But... It, when I first started, it was maybe a 30 or 45 minute presentation. Okay. And now, since you add social media yeah. and everything else, it is now three hours solid. Wow. And, and how much is it uh, scholarship based and how much is it preparing for you know, that college life? It's like, for example, being uh, smart with social media and computers. Well, what, uh, what we found over time is there's a couple of things. So from the funder's perspective, people that are choosing folks for scholarships, mm. I've gotten feedback that a lot of folks, uh, not just in Indian country, but in the United States, we lack reading comprehension ability sure. <laughs> and <laughs> how to dot I's and cross T and follow instructions. <laughs> Auto so, text, right? Yeah, so whatever <laughs> happens on an application... They will read instructions and do what they want instead of what the instruction says. Yeah. And that will lose scholarship money. Right. Um, so, it, you know, following the details is critical, and we seem to have lost that ability. So I talk a lot about the process and how to do things and the, the, the things I've learned, the skill sets. And these skill sets extend into your career, your job. Yeah, interviews absolutely. I mean it will take you further than just scholarship applications sure. but it starts with these I learned a lot of skill sets I use today doing scholarship mm -hmm. applications now what I hear from um, the students and the parents they just have no concept of how to do the scholarship search or um, application process mm -hmm. some of the feedback I've gotten is I had parents that wanted to go back to school, but they had no idea that there was all this money out there oh, and that they, they needed to start with Google. They needed to start with fastweb.com. Right. So it's, the idea is we are less than 1%. As Indian country, we're less than 1% of the population in the United States, and that includes all the box checkers on the U.S. Census. Right. So I was given a considerable amount of money to help with my bachelor's degree and it funded that and I came out debt free in my mechanical engineering degree and I couldn't understand why people were so readily giving me money. And I and number one I did my job as a student. Sure. With the GPA and academics being the focus. Right. Um I had debate and other stuff. Um but you know 
there's only so many people that can go to the NFL, but everybody could be an engineer and make a ton of money every year, right? Yeah. <laughs> if they wanted to apply math and science skills, for example. Uh, but the uh, process is that the reason I was given so much money or so many opportunities, I found out later, uh, looking back at National Science Foundation statistics, is I was only one of like 75 females that graduated in any engineering discipline or degree level, bachelor's, really? master's, or PhD, that entire year. Wow, that's huge. So if the college scholarship preferred a female Native American with an engineering degree, I was, you got it. I just had to apply almost and I would yeah. get the money. They were excited to see me. That's great. Wow. Um, and so you, you said your history is an at-large person. Um, how does that affect your workshops? I mean, are, are they mostly within Cherokee Nation or um, you know, do, does part of your workshop cater towards everything? Or does it all cater towards you know, anybody? Uh, 80, 85 percent of it is focused on anyone who walked in. Uh -huh. um, but overall, my scholarship is focused on Cherokee Nation citizens or, or in a broader perspective, Indian people, because you can use, I use a context of being a Cherokee Nation citizen. Mm -hmm. sure. So one example of that is I have an action item or to-do list that I hand out with it. If you are a tribal citizen and the it's a three-year wait for citizenship or a year before you get a replacement card. Right. You cannot wait until your senior year to go apply for citizenship. You, so one of your takeaways, your action items going home is go make go to, in, wherever it's at, make sure that your white certificate of degree of Indian blood and your blue card for us, right. our citizenship, do you have it, number one? Then you have to look at it. Is it legible enough in good enough condition that you can copy it? For an application, mm. it's about logistics. <laughs> so, now, I like how proactive <laughs> this is. Yes, because so, now we're three years ahead. Like, okay, I need to get on this card, and you know. And to be honest, I have a couple cousins who are completely eligible, but they're you know they have to go through that process, and we're trying to get them now before it's you know that time, right? You can request an education expedite from your tribal council person, but we shouldn't be at that place. Yeah. It should be less than a year for citizenship. Mm -hmm. But even then, um, I think there's a misperception by some families and students that they can get this stuff overnight. Well, you can only apply for the Gates Scholarship one time in your life. Mm -hmm. There's a very narrow window to have all your stuff in. Yeah. Because you have to have your FAFSA, which it requires taxes and all sorts of stuff, even if it's estimates. So you really only have this two-week period to get all your paperwork together. And they should know that deadline's about January 15th every year of their senior year. Mm -hmm. So if they don't have their paperwork in and everything in order, they will never be able to apply for that scholarship ever again. Wow. And that's the, the golden goose of all scholarships, yeah. right? That's right. like a full ride all the way through your PhD if you want it. But you have one opportunity. So if they don't have all the stuff lined up, that's required on the application, including like citizenship. And I talk about from our context as Cherokees, but I'm sure whatever the tribe is, they have their own form of citizenship paperwork. Yeah. And I don't know what that is, but they should use that then as saying, I got to get my citizenship paperwork. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or even Cherokees like living outside of the, uh, the jurisdiction as well. Um, yes. That's interesting. So is it, uh, you being on the travel council, is, is it affected as far as the content, maybe, or... Um... Yeah, the logistics part of it, knowing okay. that that kind of paperwork for citizenship and that there's free opportunities. So the other thing I talk about is if you're a Cherokee citizen and genetically you came out with white, blonde hair and blue eyes and you have no context, meaning that you didn't grow up in Oklahoma on in Cherokee Nation, going to stomp dance with the language... Well, how do you compete against a full-blood Navajo straight off the res that's bilingual, former Miss Navajo? <laughs> Maybe yeah. she is Miss Navajo. <laughs> yes, yes. So um, in our context as Cherokee Nation citizens, it is free to register to vote and be active in our government. And that's something you can talk about and would get hopefully some yeah, respect sure. in an interview if you're competing against the rest of the Indian country. That's, that's an easy one to do. Oh, like it, it gives you more context as a, as a Cherokee than just a blue card. Yeah. 
because we're not just blue cards if we're active and we're doing stuff yeah. membership in our our groups so if a group has me come in I always partner with them and ask them to have their membership deal because I pitch that being a member of our groups is another way to engage and be Cherokee mm -hmm. in that context and have something to talk about in an interview because you're better money, bigger money scholarships, your better colleges, they're going to interview you and they're going to ask you questions about how you, what is your context as an Indian person. Sure. And if you just say, well, my grandma grew up in Oklahoma and I have a card, that is not yeah. going to cut it when you're competing. So it doesn't work if your great, great grandma's a Cherokee princess. And, That's uh... right. <laughs> that is right. Okay. And, and, you know, there's, there's like for $10 a year, you can take your tribal newspaper now. It used to be free. Right. Yeah. So for $10, you have every month, because in Indian country, if you truly are competing or there's Indian people reviewing your, your essays and stuff, if they were to ask you questions, they know what we're doing because we often lead the way in terms of policy and what's happening on the national front for Indian country. So they're going to follow us. If they go and ask about a contemporary issue in your government and you can't answer it, then mm, you, you're not getting the context of being Cherokee. Right. I and like I that. talk about that. Right. And that, that's really important. It's not only what's available, it's it's how to compete. What do you see uh, for the future? I mean, if uh, is there a way to uh, recruit people to continue in this? And... So one of the things uh, that I want to do is, if I'm the next chief of the Cherokee Nation, is gift this to the people. Yeah. And, and I think it's an example of what we could and should be doing with our at-large population. We need to be able to inform people in the context they live in. We don't need to mislead them and say we're going to provide for something we can't do outside of the Cherokee Nation. We need to have staff that when we come to these at-large meetings, they are there to train people to understand where their local Indian Health Service facility is, partner with these local tribes to make sure that people know what the Affordable Care Act is, to help them with their local health budget, make sure that we are telling things about how to find scholarships outside the Cherokee Nation and how to be competitive. So one of the things that I want to do is make sure that everyone, whether it's higher education in terms of an engineering degree or it's a technical degree in plumbing, sure. I want to make sure that every Cherokee, regardless of where they live, is career ready. Right. And that's what a big part of this is about. Yeah. If people can't write a simple business letter, then they are not making the money. There's a, there's a missed opportunity there. And we want, we want Cherokees to make the money. We want Indian people to make the money. We want everybody to be as financially successful as possible. Yeah, because in the end of the day, you have 200,000 uh, advocates and, and representatives of your nation, right? And you know, we aren't just citizens. We're, in a lot of ways, representing our nation when we go out to other Cherokee events or, or any events. Um, so I think that's great. Is there anything that uh, you'd want to leave the uh, listener with? Well, I think Indian people in general, and I'm especially biased toward Cherokee Nation citizens, sure. uh, I've had opportunity to be all over Indian country and all over the United States and in parts of the world. And we have some of the most brilliant people ever. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know what we've survived, all of us historically, all our tribal communities, means we're resilient and extremely intelligent. So I hope that folks take the opportunity to pursue some kind of formal training or career set uh, and don't let what they think is the money issue stop them because if they'll go do their research and they'll take time to apply, um, I love all my Indian attorneys, but you know, there's not a lot of money for attorneys because we're kind of surrounded for them. Mm, but if we need, we need engineers, we need scientists, we need healthcare providers. So if your issue is you think that school, you can't afford it, you can't pay for it, well, there is a bigger need, not just in Indian country, but across the United States for these kind of degree programs, what they call STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Right. Um, and, there's, and that also then funds human resources and all sorts of people. Yeah. That All those companies grow, and that means everybody makes money. Exactly. But there's a big opportunity to get your school paid for if you have science and math skills that if you will focus on a STEM degree, mm -hmm. now most people won't pay for the next um, 
sports injury person or sports, you know, sports medicine, because that's a more of a for-profit, it's not a public service. Yeah. But if you go into some kind of public service field, including like engineers for, or for infrastructure, so civil engineers and those things, sure. you can get the money and you won't have college debt, mm -hmm. which starts yourself out in a negative financial way as you start going out as an adult after that. Well, how does it, what about uh, like somebody involved with a business or or something that maybe is not one of the um, stems, but maybe just outside of it. There is money out mm -hmm. there. There's a ton, but you have to go look. You have to go do your research, and then you have to apply. Mm -hmm. So back to logistics, one of the things I talk about is project management and the application management and having a calendar. Sure. And you have to plan your year because you're a senior in high school typically is when you're starting to apply for these. Or you go off to college and you want to continue to apply for money because yeah. there's still money on the table even in college. Right. Yeah, a lot of people it's don't not, know that. Yeah, it's not just that freshman year of college. You have to, it's an ongoing process. So people really need to go out and plan that, know when things are supposed to be delivered. Um, and one example is when we had severe ice storms and snowstorms in Oklahoma, Gates did not care. And so there was two weeks where people were without power uh. in Oklahoma. So we had all these Oklahoma kids that had not planned, had, were not ready. Um, they didn't think about that. And they lost an opportunity, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So you should never let the ice storm, the snowstorm. You need to be a planner. You need to think ahead, have your calendar laid out, right. and know when you're supposed to start stuff. So, yeah, right. And don't forget thank you notes. <laughs> Personal handwritten Follow thank up. you notes are still a huge opportunity to connect with people that have helped you out and build a lifetime commitment for those people with you and appreciation that social media can never do. Uh, I totally agree with you. I totally agree. And um, thank you for, for being such a huge advocate for education. I mean, that is so refreshing to see because... At the end of the day, you're building that next generation of Cherokee leaders, and you know which direction do we want to steer them, and we want to make sure that, that they are educated and and uh, you know have a sustainable career after education. So I appreciate it, and uh, thank you for your time. <laughs> okay, thanks for listening to another episode of Red Essay Season Two. Big Wado to Kara for coming out and sharing her experiences with her college workshop. For more information on her, I'll make sure to uh, add her website below, as well as information for the future of Cherokee Nation's hand and College Ready students. I think there was a lot of gems here. One of the biggest things that I personally took out of this, and how I wish I could go back in time, really, was how scholarships don't end after freshman year of college, and to remember to keep pushing for financial aid. So I hope you enjoyed it, and make sure you uh, tune in next time for Red Essay Season 2. Enjoy your week.